different. But so again, uh, these craters, as you can easily see, are not easy to see. <laughs> On the ground, you, this is Sheep Mountain up here, and from the ground, looking up at it, there's about a dozen craters in that view right now, and yet. As Gene walking around out here trying to hunt deer, you know, they just look like rocks and trees and bushes. Um, but he, when he got to the one, the biggest one, and we'll show that, I uh, showed the first one, but a, a lower angle shot here in a minute, uh, he recognized it and thought, well, this is different. It uh, looks like it might be an impact crater. Now, this is the red goose egg formation, which actually lays on top of the Casper formation. The Casper formation is mainly sandstone, a few carbonate dolomite, but it just looks like cliffs and trees, but from this perspective. Um, previous work, again, found by Gene George. At that time, he told Peter Huntoon at the University of Wyoming was a faculty member there about it. Peter came down, looked at it, and then he got a, uh, a senior student, Terry Katzning, to come down uh, and look at it. And she did a little report, and she believed there were five craters. So she was the first kind of scientific write-up about it. And that was, again, in a the UW Space Grant thing, um, which I don't know, many of my students here are here. I've had like a dozen of them. And we're going to be working on another one this fall. We actually got another grant to drill more uh, from the NASA Space Consortium again. And then we have two papers. Um, and uh, I'm never the senior author so far. Kingston, Sundell, and Cook in 2018. These are all free online. And, uh, and then another one here that was last year, which is Geological Society of America. Um, so we have a number of papers out about them now. Um, but what really got me knowing about these craters was the eclipse in 2017, which went right through Casper. And so some of the geological groups, including the AAPG, American Association of Petroleum Geologists, they have a planetary geology division. So they're a huge worldwide group, one of the biggest geological groups in the world. Um, and so their division called up Casper College, geology department, and said, look, we'd like to come see the eclipse from your place because it's coming right through Casper. And so we said, great, we'll plan on that. And in planning, we knew they were going to be here for the eclipse, but being geologists, I wanted to show them things in the nearby rocks and geology that were related to space. So we went out and we saw the, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary for the big impact uh, 65 million years ago uh, out to the north of Casper here. We went and looked at that. I knew that day goes into that visit many times now. And then I'd heard about these craters down by Douglas. And, I, and I'd heard little bits and parts from uh, Carl Oswald, I think, here. Carl had mentioned that he'd seen him, and, and uh, Woody Martin had seen him as well. And But I never could get a grasp on him of what they'd look like. Um, but anyhow, so they this AAPG group came, and it included uh, Jack Schmidt. So he was the last, the only geologist to walk on the moon, and the last, the last person to walk on the moon. So he came out and saw the eclipse, but then we went out to my to the craters that we'd been mapping, and he was like, sold. These are definitely impact craters, and it's a lot easier to look at them here on the ground than to go to the moon first. So, but another thing that happened simultaneously was that year before they came, um, uh, Casper College with Jeff's son, we bought a lot of drones and we started teaching the flying of drones with our students, various students, and uh, flying these drones and that's the right perspective to see these craters. So when you're on the ground, a lot of times 
know, they don't look like much. But when you get up in the air and look down on them, uh, then you really start to see them. This is, and then we also, another advent that came along was, of course, um, looking at Google Earth. This is what that crater one looks like on Google Earth. It looks a whole lot different than that first image I showed you. So Google Earth averages a lot of things. But it does look like a crater. You see a hole in the middle, you see several rings around it. But uh, the drones get a much better perspective uh, on it. So this is the same picture. So that's Google Earth. This is the drone shot. Uh-oh, I hit something. There we go. That's the drone shot. You know, like night and day, but that's, it's just the way Google Earth is. So we started using Google Earth to look for others in the area, and we found a lot of them. So this is just one area, and it doesn't even include the big crater, SM1, is over here. But those first five um, that Cass name found was SM1, SM2, which is one of the prettiest ones, and then SM3, 4, and 5. So those were the first five that, uh, and, and Jean found the first one, which is bigger, and then she found these four. And then all the rest that you see on here were ones that we found using drones and flying the area within that same vicinity. And many of these craters or a stone's throw from each other. I mean, they're under 100 yards. Some of them are, are almost overlapping each other. In this case of these, they can be quite close to each other. Um, again, a little bit of location again. There's the Laramie Range there. There's Casper, Powder River Basin to the north. There's Douglas, so Sheep Mountain is to the southwest of Douglas. These purple boxes here are Paleozoic rocks. So these impact structures are old. They're not recent, they're 280 million years old when they hit the Earth's surface. And those are now very hard rocks on what we call the top of the Paleozoic. And all these blue are kind of those same age rocks. So after finding them first on Sheep Mountain, we started looking at these other areas into that. So this is again uh, Google Earth showing all the pins are craters. We found over 70 of them on Sheep Mountain alone. Now this is using Google Earth and then we go back and we have to field test them. So we have to go to each crater. Well then we got to get the landowner's permission because they're probably on 20 different landowners. <laughs> And then you've got to actually physically get up there. These are not easy places to get to. So you've got to climb up and look at them all. Well, then we started looking at these other areas that have the same rocks. These same blue rocks that you see here is the top of the Paleozoic, this Casper formation that we have. And we started to find more craters. Everywhere it was exposed, we found craters. But there was a nice line of them initially looked like a straight line, and my initial partners in the paper saw that straight line and said, well, then that's the direction the impactors came from, and I tried to argue with them that that's not true, that's just because that's the exposure of those rocks are only exposed there because they've got red beds on top of them on that side, and on this side, they're eroded off. <laughs> so the reason that line is there is that that's the geology saying that's the only place the exposure of rocks that are 280 million years are. And then we found those same exposures. So then we started knowing if you just go to that contact between the top of the Casper and the red beds over the top, there's the craters. And so we've been looking around ever since. This is again Sheep Mountain in Google Alert. Um, sheet mountain right there, red beds on top. Now we're going to look at a cross section across that, and then these would just be representative where some of the craters are at. Oops, not the cross section yet. This is a crater, a different crater. This is SM36, and there's a goose egg right there. 
And so you get your very best craters if they're close to that contact. So those red rocks lay on top of this unit down below. And when they lay on top, uh, you can't see <laughs> the craters underneath. But this one has been relatively recently, probably in the last 10 to 20,000 years, exposed where the red beds have come off. So then you get a nice crater form and a series of rings around it, typical of what we see on Google Earth, and then we go out and look at it. So there's a cross section, a slice down into the earth, of uh, the Sheet Mountain. So Sheet Mountain is what we call a large anticlinal feature. A lot of the big oil and gas fields are on those in Wyoming. So it takes older rocks, pushes them up, a little bit like Casper Mountain, where the older rocks are on the other side of a big fault. Well, this one's got a big fault as well. But where the craters are, are over here on the north side. In the Casper Formation in yellow, the craters are right at the top of it, right underneath this red, reddish bed called the Goose Egg Formation there. And then underneath it is the Madison. So that's kind of a cross section, and then this would be a view of what it looks like, where this is the Casper, and then you get this red Opeachy member of the Goose Egg on top of it. So all the rocks have been tilted up, and then the rocks right on top are these soft siltstones, claystones of the overlying Opeachy Shale in the Goose Egg. And so erosion has just removed them quickly, but the hard rocks stand up and make these surfaces, and that's where the impact craters are. They're on these uh, extremely old surfaces. Now, geologically, like I said, we name all these things, um, where the top of the Casper in that area is a boundary between the Pennsylvanian and the Permian. It's actually what we call unconformity. There's an erosion there. And so there's the erosion zone right in that area. And again, the goose eggs, red beds on top. The really red is the chug water above it. But the craters where those blue are are kind of uh, cut down into the Casper. And actually, the Opeachy red beds go down and fill the craters. Um, we figured that out as well. Um, so time-wise and just, and again, about 280 million years ago, but we don't know precisely yet. We have never found a mineral yet that we've dated to give us the exact age. So we think it's early Permian, but somewhere between the Pennsylvania and Permian boundary. So these are, when we fly drones with lots of students, and then somebody gets the job of making composites, where we take a half a dozen different flights and lay them together on top of each other. So now we've got the big crater, SM1, right there. And this is a rock quarry. There's a big rock quarry there mining the castle. And so, which is good, because they gave us access to get the drill rig a little closer on some of their roads. Up what doesn't appear to be steep, but is steep, when you see some other pictures. And then again, you can see all these other craters out that close-up we saw earlier. And then there's little ones in here. They aren't even labeled. There's one there, and there's one there that we found later. Um, so this is crater one, again, from ground level. This is what Gene George probably first saw. He, that picture up there, this is the crater rim. It goes all the way around it, and then it's full of trees and sagebrush in the middle, and a little bit of red rocks, which we drilled in, which is the bottom of the goose egg. Um, was in the center of the crater, was still there, and not eroded out. But you get rocks that are blown out by the craters. That rim is vertical. So these beds were originally deposited flat, and then during what we call the Laramide orogeny, the anticline was tilted, and all these beds were tilted at an angle of about 20, 20 degrees uh, when, that, when that occurred. So, and the craters are slightly tilted, uh, but those beds are vertical. 
So they're way steeper than what tilting by the mountain building forces did. And again, many of them have vertical edges and walls around the edges of the craters. Then we also see breaches, which are breaches are plastic broken up rocks. And these breaches, we call them impact breaches, are due to the force of the impact of the bolide hitting. And then they also produce these, this is a rock hammer. These are what we call breccia, broken angular fragments. But then this material that's in between the brecciated rock is where we find the shock quartz. So we sample that, we take thin sections of it. You'll see some thin sections in a minute about what we see in detail when we do the detailed analysis of it. Now that crater rim is kind of odd. There's no real single fault, and this is the bedding coming off the mountain, and then it just kind of rolls up like it's plastic. Um, right when it hit, it was obviously making its plastic behavior in order to do that, and at the same time, it took what would have been green to blue sand and cemented them into what we now call a quartzite. So it, metamorphosed. It changed those sand grains into a very hard metamorphic rock called quartzite. So we probably have at least 130 possible craters using Google Earth. And then we follow up with drone mapping, geological mapping of the bedding, fracturing veins, these ejected breaches from when the impact hit. Then we do thin sections looking for the shock quartz. And if we find the shock quartz, so this uh, Thomas Kinkman out of Germany, who's a co-author on those other papers, that's really all he does <laughs> in Germany, is he studies impact craters around the world. Anytime a meteorite hits, he's there the next day. And, uh, and so that's really his specialty. So we invited him in to work with us as we started these papers. And so he usually has a final say. He, does the thin sections and can recognize the shock quartz better than anybody else, and we'll see some later. When he says, gives the, his stamp of approval, unequivocally, it has to be meteorite impact, because only meteorite impact can produce some of these features that we see in the shock quartz. Ultimately, the drilling and the geochemical studies of nickel, palladium, chromium, etc will help finalize those studies, and that's what we did when we started the drill. These are just a few of the craters we haven't even looked at yet. So this one's on Labonte Creek Anticline. <coughs> Looks just like our crater one. We haven't even been there yet because it's on land that I couldn't get permission to go to. So there are a lot of craters that haven't been studied yet, but we see a lot of features like the overturned blocks that indicate that that's going to be good. This is another one when you see this rim-like feature. When you see that ring and then these beds are kind of equally dipping to vertical in that area, that's pretty indicative of what we use to spot craters. There were three of them here on Google Earth, one there, one there, and one there, but when we went back and sampled them, these two turned out to be craters. That one did not. So there are a lot of, there are some circular features that we see on Google Earth that end up not being craters um, as well. And so we have to go through and screen those out. Um, this one is <coughs> not a crater hole, but it's a very deep cross section. So when these craters hit, some of them have beautiful rings, but some of them, if you go deeper down with erosion, you just get kind of a circle. And this is one of the ones that Tyler Hathaway mapped with, a, with the drone. And then he sampled, and we actually have shot quartz out of fractured veins that cut across that. So this is like one of the most eroded craters, where it still had veins of shock material going down in it, but it doesn't really look like a crater much. There's Tyler, and these are all the students. Again, the beauty of this project, and we're getting tested for colleges, I always have all this. So I don't know how many classes now I've offered, and I've got a range of students over the last 10 years helping me fly drones and gather data. And again, many, several of the people here are on that list. 
Um, this was one of the second and probably one of the previous craters, um, SM2, and it was done by Nicole Coleman, who was actually here. I saw her come in over there. So Nicole was one of the students in this class who flew the drone. And so this is an example of a student map. So each student had to fly the drone, make the drone map, and then go in. And it's hard to see, but there are stripes and dips in there. And then these green are, are rings of veins that go in a circle around the edge of the crater. And there's veins that go, um, boy, my pointers have run out of light. The yellow ones are radiating out like the spokes of a wheel. And so when the impact hits, it makes fracks that fracture out. So we have rings of veins, we have veins that fracture out. And when we sample those and do thin sections, that's usually where we find the shock quartz, is in these fractured veins that have impact breccia injected out into there from that initial impact. So these objects come in at 8,000 miles per second <laughs> and incredibly high speeds. And when they do, they liquefy a little bit of rock, and, and that liquid rock goes injecting out into these veins um, around it, and then it turns the whole regional area hot enough to metamorphose it. So, um, so that was an example of what the students do on the individual craters. This was a thing we called Jack Rock, where Jack Schmidt, I had a great picture of him, but I didn't put it up, I had him in a different picture. But um, this one, when he went up there, it had a lot of the veins cutting across it, and it had a lot of data of cross bedding and things. Really good rock to teach the students what to look for out in the field. Um, and that's just a close up, now we can see it better, of Nicole. So they, we got lots of pictures. So the green rings are veins around the margin, the yellow ones are veins that are radiating out away from the center. And this one, again, has not had significant erosion over the top. And we haven't drilled it, and so I'm not sure whether it'll have red beds in it, like SM1, but it might. So it's pretty high level. You really see that initial impact. And these are just her field book and showing some of the veins that she was mapping with GPS points. Then we go out and we measure the depth of each of the craters. Like I say, these are all different students learning how to use GPS, drones, and field mapping techniques. And then there were three more craters here. These are kind of doubled, where it's like one, two, and then that's the smallest one. That one up there would fit in this room. In fact, it's only about a quarter of this room. It's probably only 30 feet across. So a lot of these are very small um, craters that we found. This is another one that wouldn't, wasn't recognized, but it ended up being a big one out around there that Al and Joe um, worked on. Just examples of, and then this is one, so we took enough drone data that we can put them into 3D models. It's just that I'm not very good at making those models work. If I was here right now, I'd be playing with this, and then it'd crash, and then I'd have this get one of my friends like Nicole or Dave over here to fix it. So, but this is a picture I took of the screen of a 3D model, and you can kind of see, so we can do, we have 3D models on all of these. If you have the right computer and everything working well, you can spin it around 3D, look at it, you can make digital elevation models, meaning like topo lines. And you can see you have this hard rim around it, but this side is open on this side. But it has a very deep hole in there, and that's uh, the side of sheet map. So we can put them into 3D, um, and if you have the right software, we can get you. We haven't put them on a site yet that it's all accessible. Our hope will be to eventually put it all where it's accessible, where if you have the right 3D modeling tools, you can do it as well. Well, then it expanded. So we put out our first paper, mainly about Sheep Mountain. 
And then we went out and started looking Google Earth and started looking at other paleozoic rocks <coughs> down towards Laramie, Palmer Canyon out onto the Laramie Plain, Fetterman Ridge is on the Laramie Plain. They're on the other side of the Laramie Range where those same rocks go over the Laramie Range and then they tilt back to the other side. <coughs> well, lo and behold, we found craters over there too. And the initial paper said that the direction of impact was like this because of the way they lined up kind of in a northwest southeast. Now when we found these other ones, Tinkman and Doug Cook kind of <laughs> cherry picked several of them and said, okay, we think those are coming in this way. And so they thought that they were impacted by a very large impactor that would have had to crash into western Nebraska, easternmost Wyoming, and that these are what are called secondary impacts. Because we we're finding them not in a line, uh, like boom, 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 where one meteorite breaks apart, we're now finding them over a long width. So his argument was the big impactor was here, and then it threw out into a strewn field lots of secondary. The problem with the secondary, we actually, Pinkman wrote the paper and I put my name on it even though I disagreed entirely. <laughs> um, and Al Frazier, who's here, he put his name on it too. He did a lot of the math in the paper, but I'm not sure Al and I ever agreed. But what we did agree with was that, hey, look, this paper shows that now this isn't one mountain. It's starting to cover parts of southeastern Wyoming over a large scale. Um, many more impactors and over a very, very broad area. And what it really comes down to is almost all the outcrops, as you go further east, everything's covered. So the rocks that have these impactors are 5,000 feet deep in Nebraska. But uh, a few other people uh, here, C.K. Adams is here. He did a lot of the oil and gas work, and he and Al looked at the uh, oil and gas data out over here, and there's enough data that there's a structure contour map on top of the Casper, or the equivalent, and there's no big hole. There's no 50 kilometer size hole to create an impact that would make the secondary. And so, so that's a problem. <laughs> and that's a problem with the second paper that we'll look at here in a little bit. But the most important thing about that paper is we documented these things are over a much broader area now uh, in different places. And then in that Fetterman Ridge one, which were those right there, this is the greatest picture because it's a drone shot, so it's almost vertically down. And the gray shaded is one impact crater, that's the second impact crater, and that's the third impact crater. What you can't see is that this one, about 300 feet lower on this hill than that one, and that one's in the middle. So the craters are stacked. So you have some craters on top, some in the middle, and some that are lower, and I think there's relatively undisturbed sandstone in between, which means it's not just one event at one time, but they had to come in in multiple times over many years, hundreds, maybe thousands of years. So this event is not simple. <laughs> and and so, it, and it's getting more complicated. That was, so I really highlighted that one. The other one is just the, the normal picture. This is that crater too, from a different perspective you can now see a person, oh, looks like me, flying the drone. Um, and, uh, and you can see the hole, and this is a flipped up rim right in here, and then there's the ejecta breccia that went out the other way. So it has all the same features that we saw over at Sheep Mountain, but now we're 40 miles away <laughs> um, on the other side. So, shot quartz grains within the Casper Formation quartzite. So when we look for these impact wretches, we're uh, sampling and then we make thin sections. These uh, pictures which you're about to see suggest that these are very high speed meteorites. 
the part of the problem that secondary cratering effect is that if the first impact comes in at a high velocity, the ones that are blown out are at a much lower velocity. And yet our craters are relatively small. Most of them are smaller than or about the size of this room. So in order for you to have a small bolide to get the pressure that it takes, it has to go at much higher speeds in order to do it. So if you if you have a really, you know, a hundred kilometer wide impact or ten mile wide impact like Chicksil up, then it'll create shock quartz easily over a large area. But we have small impactors, so they have to have higher velocities to reach the pressures. Small craters, so from 0.2 meter to 5 meter, that's 15 feet or so. Um, but it takes 3 gigapascals. We don't know what that is in semi trucks stacked on top of each other, but it's a lot. Only <laughs> like from here to the moon. Um, but uh, minimum pressure to do these PDFs that you're going to see in some of these. The shock quartz has mainly been found on the inner margins of the crater walls and in the veins in anything we call impact breccia. So individual grains will contain both what we call Hertzian fractures and PDF. The PDF fractures are the ones that are only created in, in meteorite impact. They're the only things that have that much pressure. The Hertzian can occur in high uh, volcanic eruptions. And then we've also found the shock quartz grains in the basal sandstones of the goose egg. So these are the first rocks deposited on top of the crater's surface. So erosion of those craters was reworking shock quartz into the base of the goose egg uh, as well. So this is pictures, uh, 200 uh, microns of quartz grains. Um, so these are um, shock ports, and these are the fractures that you see within that grain, more kind of her hertzian. This is a whole stream of different shock quartz grains that we saw, some of them more colorized than others. These are the PDF lamellae, or the nice straight lines, and then they uh, get fluid inclusions. We call them decorated, and they have little fluid inclusions all the way along the PDF lines as well on some of them. So just, and then the highest deformation, some of which um, Kinkman's inferring is 10 gigapascals in order to create these ones that are crossed, and those are shear structures from that very high impact, and can only be made by impact craters, and so. These are just a few of the things that they look at. And we've done a few thin sections here on these. We've found a few, but really, Thomas Kinkman's really been the guy we've been relying on to label all these up and tell us what pressures and temperatures they occur at, because that's what he does. So these are the PDF type fractures, and of course, with these decorated fluid inclusions, there's these little bubbles that line up right along the uh, deformation of the melon. Um, and then this one has both. This is a Hertzian fracture here, impact from one side of the grain. These are the PDF. This is the edge of the sand grain. So this is one single grain of sand at 40 microns. And then this would be the cement that eventually makes the sand stick together into a sandstone or quartzite. You can see the fracturing doesn't go into any of the cement. So those grains were shocked before they became cemented, which might have happened 10 million or 100 million years after the actual impact. Okay, so besides the rocks and the grains, we did geophysics, um, which is we electrically probe the rocks. So the shock impact metamorphisms change these sandstones into quartzite which make them highly resistive. So, uh, and the resistivity on some of the things you're gonna see is 10,000 times the background, uh, or that there's 10,000 times change, as it turns out, it's a conductivity anomaly. So when we shoot these lines, we see the normal uh, uh, 
um, Casper, but then we see these zones that are highly conductive, which means there's some other metal in there. And that's why we drilled the well. And however, the chemically stable elements, so iron itself won't be there. It moves in groundwater so easily that we never expect to find an iron meteorite. But what we find are the residuals of other elements that are not common in the crust, nickel, chromium, palladium, uh, and other things that are in with normal meteorites that you find. So this is the resistivity <coughs> line that we shot. And that one east to west, um, my light pointer really died, but right there is the actual crater, that little spot right there. Um, and then this one's perpendicular to that one, right about, you see where it says drill here in two spots, those are the two wells we drilled this fall. One of them was right in the middle of the crater, and the other one was up on the lip to the side. But that blue zone right there, that's 10,000 times more conductive rock than all of the Casper formation is. And so the, the thinking is that those are residual metals. Even though iron is generally left, and there may be a little iron, if it is, it's going to be an oxide, not elemental iron like you find in the meteorite. It won't be magnetic anymore. But we think it's going to have the nickel, chromium, and all these other elements that are in meteorites. And that's why, after we saw the resistivity line, we saw that <laughs> um, high conductivity anomaly so that's what we tried to go drilling. This is just a different interpretation um, showing that's the actual crater right there with the Opichi inside it. And then all the rest of the orange, red, light green, that's all Casper formation, but it's more resistive <coughs> because it got turned into quartzite. So the heat from the impact turned all of that into quartzite and then it did these little rings. So when we see those rings around them, that knob there, that one, that one, those are actually part of these pressure rings that develop, and they somehow harden those rocks. And you know, more drilling is the only way we're going to know that. We got to drill more of these features. Um, we see the data in the magnetic. So we did magnetics over it. I don't know if Beth Wisely is here, but um, Beth um, did come out and help with the magnetics and a lot of her students at that time. So there's a very hint of the ring of the crater in there, but not a lot. Um, and like they say, most iron from the meteorite would have been turned into iron oxide, hematite, which is no longer magnetic. But there's a little bit of residual in there, and that might be these little pieces you're going to see in these polished sections and thin sections in a minute here. So again, whole list of students that helped in hauling the geophysics equipment, hundreds of pounds of equipment, cables up and down the rocky slope in bad weather. Um, again, a long list. Um, and then we come to last fall where we finally got the resources together to drill. And University of Wyoming Geophysics Department, uh, Brad Carr, um, he brought the drill. So they had a drill that they bought with money a long time ago on a grant they wrote to buy all this equipment. And the community colleges shared in being able to use the equipment in order to help teach our students at an early stage of their education how to do this, how to do geophysics, and how to probe the Earth with the electrical cords and things like that, and uh, the resistivity, where we basically hook up big car batteries and you know shock the Earth with the car battery, and then we see where the electricity flows through it faster than it does other places in order to get that resistivity and conductivity. And that's about just sending electricity. But eventually, now we're inside Crater 1, and we're drilling. So this is a little drilling rig, not a very big one, but we couldn't have got a big one into this place. It took us, I don't know, almost a month of building road to get that one in there. Uh, my students would argue it was, uh, should have got a PE credit for 
<laughs> without a doubt. So this is the drilling rig closed up with Brad Carr. Now that first drill was in the crater itself, which would have been right at the top of the pin. The, the, the second well we drilled is Z. That's where the drilling rig is standing right now. And it's outside the crater, but it's in that crater wall where we have really hard shock quartzite. And that ended up being 90 feet of core. That was our deepest core. I drilled the best. And it's mainly quartzite, right, Al? What'd you say was the rate? So Al was the one that was cutting these as we cut these cores into quarters. And your slowest rate was, was like six inches in an hour? Four. Four hours. Or four, four inches four in an hour. Okay, but anyhow, to be sitting in a rock saw and pushing for for an hour just to cut four inches, we had 90 feet of cord. We've eventually now got them all cut, but we went through three rock saws and I don't know how many blades um, getting cut, but now we can cut them and look at them. So the preliminary testing of these cores, we used x-ray fluorescence. Um, where uh, University of Wyoming, Ken Sims, is their faculty who does lots of geochemistry on rare earth, or on uh, platinum group minerals, which is like osmium, palladium, iridium, for the original iridium boundary. So he got really interested in it, and so he invited us down, and we used their machine to zap our cores. And when we did this, we had, uh, in most of the samples, we had iron, of course, you expect, but it's not a lot. And then chromium, rubidium, titanium, vanadium. Moderate samples, we had nickel, a lot, copper, lead, zinc, some manganese. And in a few samples, we had the rarest ones, like palladium, gold, mercury, tungsten, strontium, thorium, and some uranium in some of the samples. So, those few ones, and actually, so the chromium, uh, rubidium, nickel, and palladium are probably the ones that really tell you it had to be a meteorite. Um, in order to have those rarer elements uh, in it. Um, so, further things we can do to the core. Uh, detailed chemical analysis. So we just did it with an x-ray fluorescence gun. It takes about five minutes per sample to go down the core. Um, and so in order to substantiate those results on the rare earth, we're going to do isotope geochemistry on it. And one of our previous students here, uh, Adam Cooldridge, many of you might know him, he's now working on a master's degree with Ken Sims at University of Wyoming on one quarter of our cores. So we cut them in half first, and then we cut one of the halves into halves again into quarters. So they're going to do the detailed geochemistry, which of course Adam is great at. He loves chemistry. So we got him back to work down at UW working on those. But they're also using nuclear activation analysis out of a nuclear lab, the USGS in order to get these isotopes. So the isotopes are more important. That's how they followed the iridium boundary from Chicxulub around the world. It wasn't just iridium, it was certain isotopes of iridium, the, the iridium. And we're hoping to do that with either chrome, nickel, or palladium. Or maybe we'll have iridium too if we drill more and hit more right where the impactor was. Then one quarter of our cores that we cut were sent to Germany where Thomas Tankman, he's at the Albert Ludwig University in Freiburg, Germany, and his graduate students, he already had two graduate students, but he's probably gonna have a couple more working on the shock port, doing thin sections and more structural analysis of the fracturing. And that fracturing is unbelievable. You'll see some pictures here in a minute. Uh, there's a, a big story in there. And the remaining half of the cores are here, and we're polishing them to reveal with the more ease the fracturing, brecciation, and fluid injection here at Casper College. 
So now, this is a, a blow up of one of the cores, and there's some core boxes right behind Eric here. Um, and this is just a segment, like a six inch segment, two, two and a half inches wide, um, that Al polished up. I don't remember how much elbow grease, like six or eight hours just to polish one slab because it's port size. This is one of our hardest rocks we have on the planet. And so it's hard to polish, but they've been doing it with our rock lab. And then, and you see this incredible fracturing pattern that's within it. And then you see the close up. So this is two and a half inches, that's 10 millimeters. This is five millimeters and three millimeters. So when we look at these fractures, you can see some of the individual grains, but then these fractures are kind of amorphous silica in there. There's some form of silica. There's also little red dots, There's little, which indicate oxidized iron. So it was maybe original elemental iron that's now oxidized, but there's certainly a lot of red dots in some of it. And in these veins that were darker, those are the ones when we did the x-ray fluorescence on those are the ones that had the nickel chrome. So they're the ones that proved to have shock quartz and the odd chemistry in them. So we're just looking in, and what we see is it looks like when the impact hit, it literally melts the rock right there and fractures out. So like we do in oil and gas with fracking, that's what this meteorite did. When it hit, it fractures everything, it melts everything, and then it injects those fluids out. And some of the heat of the impact is actually melting the quartz right in place along these fracture horizons that we have. This is a different one, a little more iron, so it gets very purplish, although color enhanced a little bit, you said, Al. <laughs> but are they color enhanced a little bit? They're color enhanced, but not color shifted. Okay, so the colors are correct, <laughs> but uh, a little brighter than they appear when you first look at them. But they, we do go, every time we see darker veins, they're the ones that almost always have the shock quartz in them. And so, as you look at the smaller cross-sections of these veins, these are the individual sand grains that you're looking at here. Um, and you see that there's stripes in there of different colors, but they're not what we call zoned, where one side looks exactly like the other side. So they're probably being formed as the rock is splitting and shifting you're melting the crystals along the way and uh, fracturing them. So this is just another picture. Uh, and again, thanks to Al Frazier and Paula Condelario who helped do the thin sections on some of these and has helped Al a lot in, in polishing and doing thin sections and photography of some of these. So. Uh, large scale fractures in the core, so this is what the core looks like, that's what it looks like under magnification. Now what's weird about this is these things that should be single grains are becoming stretched out. So this is what we call a cataclastic flow. And it happens with sharp, uh, along fault planes and impact. Whenever you break something and crush it, you'll take something around and you'll string it out into something that's very fluid-like uh, along those exposures. This is just a close-up of one of those. And so those fractures, if this was secondary after the Laramide orogeny, so a lot of these geologists who worked on the Casper, there's a lot of hard fractures cemented after the Laramide. They're mainly quartz, and they're mainly zone because the liquid goes down and you zone the two walls and you get parallel. You get parallel zoning like you see in an agate on both sides of the wall. Instead, we get this fluid-like flow indicating that fluid was injected. There's almost no way to make that sort of structure except with very hot fluids being generated right on the impact. So those are the details. 
So the following students helped in the drilling, road building, pad building, water hauling. Thousands of gallons of water had to be hauled up there. This is a nice perspective of the drill unit and where we drill hole Y, and then we drill hole B right up there. They're probably about 100, 150 feet apart from each other. And we're going to go back and drill more holes this, this summer. Um, this is another argument. A lot of the craters appear oblong, uh, and some of that is a little bit, it's, it's weird because the beds are tilted. If you take a circle and tilt it and look at it vertically, they all appear a little oblong because of your perspective if you tilt the circle. They're a little more tilted. Because of that, Thomas Pinkman and Doug Cook, my co-authors, they said all the impactors had to come from this way. Well, I disagree. <laughs> and, and they have that argument because every astronomer who works on planets in our solar system all agree that if it's an oblong impact crater on the moon or Mars or wherever, the impactor had to come in parallel to the length. I disagree with that. I think the geological data suggests that the impact direction is perpendicular to that, actually, on this one. This is the steep wall. This is almost horizontal beds. And Kinkman said, well, this all eroded away. And I said, it's so hard. How could it erode away? It should still be there. And, uh, and I'll show you another. But this is where our anomaly is of the high conductivity metals is over here. And so that would suggest to me that the impactor came in here and it's buried underneath there at about 75 feet down. And we tried to drill right into the anomaly, and we couldn't get it there because of lost circulation. So the better-looking diagram was the one Tinkman did in our one paper, but I changed it. <laughs> in reality, <laughs> what you really see, he thinks about a model that he created in his lab by blasting objects into sand at supersonic speeds and seeing what happens. I look at what the rocks actually say. And the rocks say these beds are vertical or overturned, and these beds are horizontal. And even though we've tilted them so that originally this was all a flat surface when the sand was deposited, even though we've tilted them, <coughs> we wouldn't have the 40, we wouldn't have horizontal and vertical. So I think it actually came in at an angle, not vertically down. Um, and, and we see that not just on one crater, but many of the craters. So, future work, we've got to finish drone mapping, and now we have new LiDAR equipment that we just got last year, courtesy of SME, and we haven't done it yet on the craters, but we hope to do it this fall. Uh, more drone mapping of all the other possible craters from, from Google Earth. Improved dating of the Opichi, and when I gave this talk about two months ago at UW, Dr. Kevin Chamberlain, who does uranium lead dating, he wants to date and look for zircons in our shocked areas at three gigapascals will metamorphose the zircons and it'll reset the uranium ages. And so he thinks we'll get a date out of zircons if we keep looking, which great. That's what we really needed, that date right when it hit would help us a lot. So that will be good. Continued samples of impact breaches throughout Wyoming. Um, and then looking for the associated uh, rare elements associated with the impact craters. Did I, I think I moved too fast there. Oops. Um, more geophysics over other craters. Um, and to see how many craters are completely buried. And we know there's a lot, based mainly on hearsay from oil and gas companies like Chesapeake, who did 3D seismic over all of the southern Bighorn Basin. And when we gave the similar paper about our work at AEPG in, in uh, Cheyenne, the head of the exploration for Chesapeake, who had already shot all the 3D seismic, said, they're everywhere. Said the whole Southern Powder River Basin is pockmarked with these things on that horizon. 
Um, so it's not just a line, it really is a blanket where all of southeastern Wyoming got pelted by this. So more geophysics, and then we're going to look at the Minnelusa core data in some of the wells and see if we can show that some of these Minnelusa fields are not sand dunes, but they're actually impact craters. Minnelusa A, and I'll show that in a minute. And then we're going to try to drill this fall directly into right. We never got to the highest reason or the highest conductive part of our geophysics. We tried, we had lost circulation and we couldn't get down. But we're going to try again <laughs> and hopefully get right into the most conductive and we might find iridium and hopefully at least a lot more palladium, nickel and other things. So if you've ever looked at the Minnelusa oil and gas sand, the black is oil, the yellows are sand, and that red up there is the Opeche. <laughs> the same Opeche that we have. But what was always weird about the Minnelusa play, you either, when you drill, if you hit a lot of Opeche, you didn't get any oil. If you had a thin Opeche, you found your oil. But a lot of the wells would hit oil and they'd move 30 feet away, and it wasn't anything. And, and so they had very steep wall. This is from oil and gas people did all this data. And, and how do you get vertical walls on a sand dune? <laughs> it should fall down at the angle of repose at 30 degrees, and the red beds are put in there by slow stream action. So I'm arguing that those, a lot of the craters and the deformation they saw might be due to impact craters. This is actually Donkey Creek field in the Powder River Basin, and this is our SM1, it's the same scale, and this is uh, seismic data, velocity data, this is the actual drill holes, and so that's a structure contour map using the wells. They have exactly the same arcuate shapes, and if the impactor comes in like that. So they were interpreted as sand dunes, as bar pan sand dunes, blowing that way, but they could reinterpret them as impact craters with the impactors coming in from the other side. So you might have to reinterpret the whole Minnelusa, the upper part, the Minnelusa A again, which could affect. So another place to look is on the moon. Obviously, we have lots of craters there. And there was a study in 2019 where these folks determined that they were trying to date the age of the impact uh, craters on the moon, and they came up with a new way to date them. And what they saw, that there was an average rate of impact cratering on the moon until 290 million years, and that's lunar dating. So give or take 10 million years. In geology, which we're not quite sure. Um, and then that continues to the present. So there was a dramatic increase in impacting on the moon. And so we might have found that same event that impacted the moon uh, there. So the implication uh, is that the Wyoming site may be the correct environment to preserve a small portion of this worldwide meteorite storm that hit the Earth and the moon at the same time. So it was, a, it was an event that happened in our solar system that hit both the moon and the Earth, and we might have been lucky enough to figure it out. Now, it's very testable <laughs> as we get the geochemical data and we know exactly the markers, of palladium, nickel, chromium, just like iridium was used on the KT boundary. So we can take these other elements around the world, look for the red bed, Every continent in the world has two to 3,000 feet of red beds. And so the, my <coughs> concept, we'll get here in a minute. So we use those studies to find these chemical markers right at the base of the red bed <coughs> and see if that's when the meteorite impact hit. Lots of acknowledgments, Gene George, Carl Oswald, Woody Montford first taking me out there, the Wills Ranch. Brad Carr multiple times, Sin Sim, Karen Sue McCutcheon for teaching drones with my students, all my students, the Society of Mining Engineers for providing grant money last year, and of course, Castor College and University of Wyoming for 
all of their health in having to teach future geologists and geophysicists in the often harsh Wyoming environment. <laughs> so, the key there uh, is to come to Douglas, Wyoming and uh, walk through a dozen meteorite craters in a single day is cheaper than going to the moon. <laughs> I don't know whether I almost think I went by one of my slides too fast. Oh, there it is. Duh. I don't know. Somehow I skipped that. So my wildest hypothesis <laughs> was that the Wyoming impact site was created by a meteorite storm. Hundreds of millions of very small iron meteorites struck the entire Earth and the moon over a short time, hundreds or thousands of years. They originated from an exploded asteroid or a moon or a small planet in our solar system. And then the amount of elemental iron released when all of these hundreds of millions hit the entire Earth all the way around, that created the red bed. The Permo-Triassic red bed sequence starts right at the bottom and then that same elemental iron gets oxidized into what we see as a red bed for hundreds of years, hundreds of millions of years afterwards. So that's my biggest hypothesis. I mean, it might not be right, but that's kind of where we're headed. And it does keep getting bigger. Let's put it that way. We keep finding them further and further away, but our problem is our rocks change. So we couldn't use shock quartz because the Casper formation turned into all carbonate. And there's no quartz in the carbonate. So then our models for how to find craters falls all apart. So as we go towards Glendo, there's not enough quartz in the section to get shock quartz. We can't see the craters anymore. So that's where we need the geochemistry. So that's where UW and Adam Coolbridge and Ken Sims are going to tell us like the iridium boundary went for the extinction of the dinosaurs. We hope to follow this, and maybe all the way around the world. If I'm right, those stacked craters in the Laramie Basin are the key, because there's some on top, some in the middle, some in the bottom, and yet they're all cratered, and we've got chalk quartz in them. So it didn't all hit at once. <laughs> and so there was some separation. So I think there's some time. We don't know how much time until we get better ways to date. OK, go ahead and hit the like. bigger crater and we haven't but it's definitely an impact crater that they have shot quartz from it now so they got the chips from the core drilling out of it and the Germans took off on that and it's definitely an impact crater it's close in time because it deforms some of the same rocks um, I don't know the geochemistry I think will be needed to prove whether it's from the same object but that would move, that would extend the meteorite field to all of Wyoming, basically, because that's in the Bighorn Basin. And so the next goal is trying to find it 
other places. And actually, we just need to continue to do a lot more work on the ones that we have already. But it's been such a great um, honor to work with so many students. I mean, all the students that we have of all ages. So we have the ones who eventually get a bachelor's, but then we have guys like Al and CK and others that come along on our trip and really help us um, teach students how to do research. And <laughs> actually help. Yeah. Where, where would you look elsewhere in the world? Anywhere. Wherever the Permo Triassic Red Bed. When you see the Permo-Triassic red beds, which are on every continent, right at the bottom of the Permo-Triassic red bed, if my largest wildest hypothesis is right, you're going to have an uh, palladium nickel chromium uh, anomaly, just like the iridium anomaly from the KT boundary. And it's going to be easy to find because that red bed sequence is on every continent. And the question is, what made it? What made it? You know, that was a big thing to me is, how come all the continents have the same red bed sequence of thousands of feet? This might be the answer. So you'd be looking for the signature of the... We'll be looking for the, we'll looking for the geochemical signature. Because finding the actual impact horizon depends on where that was and was it sand? I mean, we got lucky that it was loose sand, wet loose sand, according to Kinkman, that it struck. Had it been dry sand, it would have produced a glass like we see in impact craters in Saudi Arabia, places like that. So he's very convinced it was damp, wet sand uh, on the old surface of Wyoming, horizontally bedded. But our sandstone changes into carbonates laterally, and so we can't follow our craters any further. We need the chemical signature now to go further with it, and that's what we're hoping we're getting with GW. Yep. How does this correlate with the Permian extinction? Uh, the Permian extinction is at the end of the Permian. This is the beginning of the Permian. This is on the uh, Pennsylvania Permian. And right where we're at is an unconformity. So we don't know the exact timing, but if we get that dating, if we could find some reset zircons, then we know exactly when it occurred. So the zircons in the sandstone will be really old, but it'll reset it at those temperatures and pressures. So we've got to just keep looking in our thin section. If we can find a few zircons, the new New dating techniques and single crystal laser fusion. So we only need one crystal. So we just need to find a few zircon crystals that have been shocked and metamorphosed, and we think we might be able to date the zircon. There's just not a lot of them probably there, but we'll keep looking. And we'll do more synth sections, right, Paul? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that again right from the start. You know a lot about astrophysics. Astrophysics. Uh, I wasn't trained in astrophysics, but I know a lot about physics. So as a geologist, you're, you get all the sciences. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology if you're doing paleo. So, but I also teach courses in planetary geology. So there's so much out there on the internet right now that NASA and ESA, the European Space Administration, as they study Mars and all the rovers and all the orbiters around our planet, I teach courses on that. So I, and it's geology originally looked at on Earth, but now we're applying it to what we see on other, all the other bodies in our solar system where we've taken. So I do know quite a bit about what we see there. And uh, like I say, I'm going to feel really good if I can prove to all these astronomers that they don't know how meteorite impact craters are formed. There's a lot of people who bet against me on this one. But uh, uh, I don't know. But the thing is, the only ones we've ever seen 
was that Jack Schmidt, Harrison Schmidt, he was on the moon sampling craters. But now we have all the craters on the Earth, and you can go see a dozen of them in a day and, and really look at the structures and the way they're deformed easily without them being covered in moon dust. Um, so we have the opportunity now to get a better look at impact craters, many of them at one time. So, so yeah, by learning geology here, it can be applied in our solar system and so you learn planetary geology. I'm going to tell myself an astrophysics. I can't do the math. <laughs> now, Al might be closer, but you're physicist, chemist, <laughs> combined. But it doesn't matter. When you're in science, the more math, the more physics, and the more chemistry you can get, that's all there is to it. Yes. Um, so, first of yeah. all, I want to point out that Shoemaker was a geologist. Second, oh, uh, Shoemaker Levy. Yeah, that's the Shoemaker Levy comment. That's uh, Pardon? Yeah. But, anyhow. <laughs> yeah, but he wasn't on the moon. He was, he named they named that comet after, him, which was the largest impactor. The, the most energy ever released in our solar system when that comet hit Jupiter by breaking apart and going boom, boom, boom. And that's what originally uh, Doug and him, when they saw all our craters lining up like this, they thought of the shoemaker Levy comet. And it's breaking up on boom, boom, boom. And I said, no, we just have younger rocks over here bearing them all. And they're all eroded on this side, and that's the only reason they make straight lines. And then we went out and found more of them here, and then here, and then here. And so what happened was they were linear because of the geology, the way the strike and dip of the beds is. It wasn't about how the impact craters came in. And I think the impact craters are actually coming in perpendicular now based on the geology. And so... That's why I disagree with my com comrades on the first paper. Um, uh, but that's what science is. You put out what you know, and then you learn more, you get more data, and then you change your hypotheses, and it morphs around. Um, so uh, are you thinking uh, in the future, looking in other areas that don't have a use take that have phosphorium say? Um, yeah, and that's what, there is this oil field that's now being confirmed as an impact crater in the Basin Basin, and it deformed, I can't remember exactly on that one, um, but it has the ten sleep is deformed, but I'm not sure about the phosphorid. Do you remember where the phosphorid is deformed in that? But the phosphorid is laterally equivalent, it's just changed the rock type. And that's the problem of following craters around Wyoming. The rock types change. We, we didn't hear the question. Okay, so his question was, how about the phosphoria formation as you go to northwestern Wyoming? And it is laterally equivalent in time to the goose egg, but it's now all carbonate. And so I was kind of pointing to the other folks who worked a little more on the big crater in the Big Horn Basin. I don't remember whether the phosphoria is completely involved or partially involved in that. Very little bit. Very little bit. And, and, and it so it's a, mostly it was filling. Like to refill. Um, refill with phosphoria. On, on the pen sleep that was Which, blown out of there yeah. completely, because that's Yeah, it's a lot larger creek. And a, a direct question to answer the other question over there. Uh, a good rule of thumb for smallish craters, and even our big one is small. These are nickel dime craters. Uh, they're not like 30 miles across. The thing that came in and hit the ground is about a tenth as big as the primary hole. Small. It's also related to speed. So, and, and for smaller objects, 
create the pressures needed to do shock work, they got to come in faster. <laughs> and we don't know the exact speed yet, but if we ever can figure out the exact size of the object. So drilling this year, we're hoping to hit right where it landed. There won't be an iron meteorite there, but we hope to hit the residual of where it was when it altered by groundwater and all the iron turned into hematite, but there should be large amounts of palladium, maybe iridium, and the nickel and chrome if we can drill right into where it was. And we think we know where that's at because of the conductivity of the iron. And we tried to drill into it last year, we just didn't quite get there. And then, uh, how about the site that's uh, on the Alfred Creeks? Have we visited the potential site up there? Well, yeah. And, and so some of my other class, we were looking for agate <laughs> up on the ranch, <laughs> up by the Owl Creeks, and, and we hit what could be another site up there. So I sampled it, but I haven't taken it to the next step and done thin sections to see if we have shock quartz. That'd be like halfway to this crater in the Big Horn Basin. But there could be these. The Black Hills is another one. I looked at the Google Earth, and man, there's a lot of circular features at the right time. And the problem is it's all carbonate, and you get circular features from sinkholes, too. And so you got to have access to each site. I went up there one day or one weekend. I couldn't get access to anywhere. It was too close to the Lord Buffalo site. And everybody said, I want to go look at these circular features. They always thought I was looking for artifacts, and they just wouldn't let me on. But I said, I don't want the artifacts. I'm looking at the rocks. And so there are hundreds of them, but they're carbonate, so it's hard for us to say. Some of them may be the same one. And if the thing, if we do these drill holes in the cores in the Minnelusa, and we find many of the Minnelusa wells actually have shock ports, if they actually cord that contact between the Opiki in the very top of the Minnelusa. If we can find shock quartz in them, then we're all the way to the Black Hills anyway um, by that. So it just opens up a lot of creative thinking for many geologists <coughs> in the future to follow, um, either around Wyoming or around the world. But if you have it somewhere in the mountains, or if you get out a geological map and find those blue rocks, which is the top of the Pennsylvania, and if you're walking on them and you see something that looks like a hole about the size of this room, and maybe about this deep for the initial crater that uh, Jean George found, give me a call. We'll <laughs> gladly come out and take a look at it and see if it becomes part of this um, crater system that we